This is episode 324 of Jumbo Think. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Jumble Think, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. Our guest on today's show is Maury Teherapur. More about Maury in a moment. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, if you've never subscribed to Jumble Think, head on over to your favorite place to listen to podcasts, search for Jumble Think, and click subscribe. To make it even easier, if you head on over to jumblethink.com, you'll find links to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Pandora, and more. Now let's jump into today's conversation. Hey there, friends. It's Mike Woodward, the host of Jumble Think. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I know... If you're like me and millions, if not billions of other people, your life has dramatically changed over the last few weeks. And I know that you're trying to figure out that rhythm of life, trying to figure out how to work from home, how to connect from home. Today, we have a very special guest. Her name is Maury Teherapur. She's an award-winning faculty member in the Legal Studies and Business Ethics Department at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches negotiation and dispute resolution. As a consultant, her past and current clients include Goldman Sachs Foundation, Major League Baseball, the White House Fellows Program, UPS, Wells Fargo, and the NFL Players Association. She has a new book out. It is called Bring Yourself, How to Harness the Power of Connection to Negotiate Fearlessly. Really cool conversation. And I know whether it's coronavirus, whether it's business, whether it's learning, we're going to talk about all of that and much more in today's show. So let's go ahead and join today's conversation with Maury Teherapur. We are here with Maury Teherapur. How are you doing today? You know, I'm doing really well, actually. Um, it's a, it looks like it's yet another nice day outside. And even though I'm not out there taking full advantage of it, it's nice to look out the window and see uh, the bright sky. So I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling upbeat, optimistic. Yeah. Now for you, how has uh, coronavirus impacted your life? You, you teach, you consult, you're speaking. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've released this book that we're going to be talking about, Bring Yourself, How to Harness the Power of Connections to Negotiate fearlessly. Uh, so you have a lot going on. How has this changed your rhythm or tempo of life? Drastically. Um, I travel probably 85% of my time. So I'm either on Amtrak or some airline or in an Uber um, getting to wherever I'm going. Um, very rarely home. So probably the most drastic change is I've been in one place for a few weeks now, uh, which is, which is interesting. And I thought that would make me less busy because I'm always traveling. <laughs> um, it just has me doing less laundry probably. But other than that, I've been really, really busy all day, every day. It's amazing. Well, are you teaching still virtually or are you not teaching this semester? No, I actually am teaching at Wharton. We were right in the middle of our semester. The kids had gone on spring break and we were supposed to start back up. Um, this past, actually the week before this past week. So um, I've gone from getting on a train and going to Philadelphia every Tuesday to getting up in the morning and praying that all the virtual uh, distance learning stuff goes well and that my Wi-Fi works. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a difference now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't imagine how specifically for someone like you who's always on the go, how this is uh, completely different world of being in one place and having to navigate that. Are you enjoying it or is it weird? I don't know if it's weird. It's, and I don't know if I would say I totally enjoyed it. It's just completely different, something to get used to. But what I miss, I should start there, is that, you know, I teach classes that are totally technology free. Yeah. Um, and so it's like a t technology free zone. We're all super present. We're so in tune with one another. Um, and so the biggest change has been 
how do I ensure that happens even mm-hmm. though now we're using technology? <laughs> so um, that's, that's really different. Um, I feel a little bit more in control of my life in some ways because it's really, you know, I wake up in the morning and the day is, is sort of mine. So mm. I get to do as much, and it has been a lot, as much as I want to do with it. I don't have to worry about getting to an airport. So it's been, um, in some ways, it, it's really just different. Nothing bad. Um, just takes some getting used to. Now, there's three areas of specialty for you, sports consulting, negotiating, negotiation training, and social mm-hmm. impact. So talk to us a little bit about mm-hmm. how the three come together, how they fit into what you do as an educator, as a consultant, because at, at the surface, negotiation, you could see, oh, sports, you're negotiating contracts or negotiating mm-hmm. uh, deals there. You can see social impact seems a little bit outside of that to an extent. So mm-hmm. talk about how those three things come together for you, uh, both as an educator as and as a consultant and speaker, how you're bringing those together. Sure. So I started my career in social impact and really sort of philanthropic efforts and things like social marketing. So the early part of my career was in sort of that that area. Mm. Um, now, as far as sports goes, I had always wanted a career in sports. And what I loved about sports was the fact that it had so much impact on Mm -hmm. communities. It was like the power of sport that unites, that brings people together. So um, it was one of the areas in actually the sports business industry that I was most drawn to. Um, Negotiations is interesting because it's the one place where I don't do as much um, sports is in one place I don't do as much negotiations work, but mm-hmm. for training, um, either um, athletes or I've, ta- I've trained NBA agents. Um, but the negotiations work I do is actually a little less related to the sports industry, but much more so with respect to how people communicate with one another, um, bring their you know full selves to the table, ask for what they want, sort of um, that, that's really the area of my focus when it comes to, to the sports industry with regards to negotiation. So I don't do any deal making your favorite athlete. If they got a bad contract, it was not my fault. Like that's not what I do. So you mentioned there that you've always wanted to be in the sports, uh, sounds mm-hmm. more like the business side. Were you an athlete or where did that affinity or, or enjoyment of, of sports come to be? Yeah. So no, I was not an athlete. We are um, immigrants. So I'm first generation Iranian American. So we emigrated to the States during sort of the brink of the Iranian um, revolution oh, wow. in the late seventies and moved to Boston, Massachusetts. Um, probably one of the most fervent sports fans in this country. Yeah. Um, and, you know, during a time where, our world was so broken in some ways, you know, there was the hostage crisis. There was a lot of angst, um, being Iranian, being in this country. And we've seen that since in in several moments of my life. Um, but at that time, sports became sort of this respite. Um, well, you could see Fenway park from our balcony. So I remember being like mesmerized by, you know, just about sundown when the lights came on and, there was something so magical about it. Boston Celtics, this was the heyday of the Celtics yeah, yeah. Um, with the Larry Bird and Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale, like that era. Um, and I had gone to Celtics game and um, as a kid and I was like, oh my God, this is that one place where differences fall away. Um, people come together, the cheering, the fandom. Like I fell in love because sports was magical to me. Mm. Um and that was sort of the, that it spoke to me in ways that that were sort of really deep, very emotional. I never knew how I was going to find my way there because my parents wanted me to be a doctor, specifically my father. So I didn't play sports because if I wasn't studying, I was eating. If I wasn't eating, I was sleeping. <laughs> and then and then right, rinse and repeat. And that was sort of what life was supposed to be. So sports was never something that that was sort of ingrained in me as a child that you must play sports. It was you must study. Wow. You write this book, Bring Yourself, uh, How to Harness the Power of Connection to Negotiate Fearlessly. fearlessly. Uh, And (laughs) what was the spark for this? How did this book come to be? Why this topic? Why why now? 
So I'm definitely not that person that if you ask me and say, you know, did you always want to write a book? No. Um, just like I never thought I'd be teaching one day. So um, once I began teaching, and that's a story in and of itself, um, I really fell in love um, with this topic. Mm. Um, not because of the notion of sort of because I love sports, the whole competitive aspect of it, but actually the complete opposite of that. Um, I saw how my students changed right in front of my eyes um, with respect to their level of confidence. Um, the fact that they could use this platform to speak their truth, um, ask for things that were important to them, um, really sort of bring their voice. Uh, in that in that case, it was to the classroom, but really to these, these negotiations. And so seeing that shift in my students told me, anybody can be a great negotiator, right? right? It's really that just that notion of enjoying the opportunity and not being anxious about it. Really, again, harnessing these relationships, harnessing those conversations and those connections to get to a better place professionally, personally, what have you. So I really sort of fell in love um, with the power of negotiation and really enjoyed that. And um, because I was getting so much great feedback from students and I started teaching um, in the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, uh, one day one of my mentors there actually said, you know, you should really write a book. Mm. And of course, you know, the imposter syndrome sets in and you're like, me, who am I to write a book? Like, yeah. why do I have anything important to say? Um, but you know, once I sort of got over that and started really thinking again about the change that I had seen in my students, the fact that just a little bit of instruction and 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 confidence building could really change somebody's life, um, and 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 I'm not overplaying that. I mean, I've seen it seen it happen. I thought, you know what? If I can take this message out to the world, mm -hmm. then I've done good. Um, this is this is what I was meant to do. And so sometimes I guess we don't know our calling until sort of it comes to us. I think that, that that's why I decided to write this book because I thought this was a really important message for people to have. You know, for me, I get this book uh, and I'm, I'm reading through it and, and I see your bio, I see Wharton School and I see the title of the book and the topic. And I think, I think business book, but it's much bigger than that. And the stories you mm -hmm. tell in it, uh, kind of bridge the gap of, of yes, there's a lot of business information in here, but there's a lot of information of how this can apply to a personal life. So talk to us a little bit about who this is really going to benefit, how this book's going to impact them and why, why negotiation is important, whether you're an executive of business or, uh, you're an employee. Yeah. So, um, I guess it's it's my my understanding of negotiation is that it's a conversation, right? It's yeah. problem solving, yeah. it's um, decision making, right? And um, when you think about it that way, then negotiations is life. It's yeah. something we do every day, at work, outside of work, with our kids, with our pets. I mean, we're constantly negotiating. So uh, the the thought behind who the audience of this book is, it's just about everybody yeah. uh, because of the fact that I don't focus it on a business transaction. In fact, most of the book is not necessarily about transactions, but really about this concept of how negotiations is life, that so much of our everyday is based on these conversations. And so when I think about an audience, I think everyone. When I think about who this would be important for, I think everyone, because I think it's a book that says, you are actually in control. You're, you control um, your destiny when it comes to negotiations. You have the ability to get what you want and sit in the driver's seat and reclaim your power. And that's why this book works in a marketplace at work or it works in personal relationships. Just the notion that we have a voice and how do we use it? And I think that's so important that Finding your voice in this is is a common thread on that and uh, throughout the book. I never thought about negotiation about finding your voice and and uh, really about asserting values that you put to yourself and how that impacts others. You know, we we are conditioned in this culture so often to be about the win, 
about my win, about Mm -hmm. putting my needs or desires in. And it's almost like sometimes a fear-driven motivator. Like if I don't win, if I don't get what I need out of this, then obviously it's a bad deal for everyone. So, I, I, you know, when we talk about negotiation, we see it as battle, but you're saying it's really not a battle. Or, Or if it's a battle, it's not who you think the battle's with. It's more with yourself than it is for the other. So talk to us a little bit about changing that perspective about what negotiation looks like and and how how we need to rethink and reshape that in our own lives. Yeah, so two things. So the word win or winning is one that's rarely ever brought up in class. Yeah. Um I just often think that winning means so many different things to so many different people. Mm. And sometimes when we thought we've won we actually haven't. Um, and uh, the the reason for rethinking um, how we measure winning or what kind of values we associate with it is that we've been, like you said, conditioned to do so. But, yeah. it, you know, I often tell people, and that's why the book is called Bring Yourself, is that, you know, as you're preparing for any one of these conversations, if the first thing you do is really think about who you are in your preparation, who you are who is coming to this conversation in terms of what you want people to see, right? Sort of the the values that you bring to the conversation, the things that are most important to you. Then that really is sort of defining the course of this conversation. Because, um, for example, some people say, you know, Maury, I had a great negotiation. It went really well, seemingly, right? I got the outcome I wanted, but I felt horrible afterwards. Mm. And... You know, so by all measure, you know, if you use sort of quantitative metrics, they've done really well. Well, why do you feel so badly? And they say things like, I didn't treat the person the way I thought they should be treated. Wow. Um, I was so focused on that win. Or, you know, I lost myself in that conversation and the things that matter most to me uh, because I was so focused on this sort of outcome, this winning outcome. And I really regret having done that. Well, you know, again, the 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 metric that we are all so conditioned to think about is, well, but you did well, you got a great deal. But the, the truth behind that is that it's not a sprint, right? It's a marathon. These yeah. things are conversations that could build indelible relationships, right? Relationships that could go on in perpetuity. And so if you approach it from the perspective of just winning and winning from your own, again, sort of financial outcomes, financial rewards, that that may not translate to that, the, the win that could bring you benefit, you know, in, again, in perpetuity. So that's why I feel like we really need to rethink what those concepts mean yeah. um, and think about this opportunity of, again, finding your voice and, and really focusing on, on that. As we move towards the end of this first segment, we always ask three questions. The first one being, how do you find purpose in what you do? Um, I find purpose in what I do by looking outward, by seeing the impact of this work on my students, uh, people that I, that I teach, um, looking at how they change over the course of a three hour session or a four month semester. I find purpose in the fact that people actually find confidence and reclaim themselves, um, Mm -hmm. through these conversations. So I think that's my purpose. What is one challenge you're currently working to overcome? How to teach virtually. (laughs) That's got to be a huge shift for you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. It's like, you know, all my entire being is focused on making connections with people and putting your technology away. And here I am on in a virtual learning uh, session. And I'm like, what is going on here? This is this is such an oxymoron. Um, But but it's. It's uh, that's probably my biggest challenge right now. One I think I'll overcome, but it's definitely a little stressful. Well, and, and I wanted to ask this. I was going to ask it later in the episode, but I, I think right now is an appropriate time to ask it. You know, with how we have to navigate the, the world right now because of coronavirus and so much of what you do, whether it's as a consultant or as an educator, you're very much connection or or relationally driven and mm-hmm. digital connection is something that so many of us uh, are trying to figure out and how it impacts our business, how it impacts our lives. You know, how how do we stay still 
emotionally connected when we are so detached in proximity. Right. So, you know, technology is pretty amazing. You know, when I, again, when I teach these classes, I'm like, put your phones away, don't be distracted, be mindful, yeah. be present. But, you know, all of these different, you know, whether it's Skype, whether it's Zoom, whether we use Blue Jeans at, at Wharton, the ability to actually see people, um, I think that's the, that's the part that makes a difference, right? Yeah. So, and, and there's something really special about this, you know, there's like sort of the silver lining in all this is that now when I have Zoom calls, like the, the woman who I'm speaking with all of a sudden will have her, the, her child will come into the conversation or the guy will be like, oh, I'm, my shift is from nine to 12 to, to be watching my kids. And all of a sudden they show up and we mm-hmm. say hello. And there's, we're now connected or have the opportunity to be connected with people in a really authentic way um, that's actually quite deep because we're actually seeing more of who people are yeah. because they are in their homes, yeah. right? So I think that if you commit yourself to making deep connections, if you commit yourself to being present, if that becomes a really deliberate act, then I think we can be successful despite the fact that we're not physically with one another. I think that's a huge insight because even like looking at the late nights uh, segment of television and how each of the late night hosts is incorporating this into their lives and having to do it from home. You look at Fallon and we get a look into his family life. We get to see his kids. We get to hear from his wife and and it just makes him more relatable. It makes him feel like it's more of a connection than it ever did just sitting behind a desk. Yeah, it's we're it's humanizing, right? Yeah. And and whether it's a shared experience that we're having that's not so pleasant, right? And fear ridden, and you know, you don't hear pandemic when you're like, woohoo, that's great. No, <laughs> you don't, right? So no, <laughs> but but that shared the shared fear, the shared experience, you know, this is sort of maybe a once in a lifetime thing for all mm-hmm. of us. And I feel like it's humanized us. It's brought us together because. This thing sees no color, sees no gender, sees no, you know, socioeconomic status. So somehow it's brought us together. And I think we have the tools with our technology to take that one step further and use that as a way to connect us. And our final question in this first segment, what is the next big dream or idea or goal you have? You know, I think that not that I'm going to commit to another book. I'm certainly not saying that, um, just to be clear, because uh, I'm just finally getting um, over this idea that I've, that this thing is done. Uh, <laughs> but I think that these sort of younger generations um, that that are sort of coming into this world of whether it's business or, you know, critical moments in their life that they're making big decisions – I think there's some part of me that really wants to focus on sort of educating them, Mm -hmm. um, taking this message even maybe to a generation that's, that's younger than my students of Wharton, because I think that there's no time that's too early for you to really find yourself and find your voice and be able to make better decisions. And um, again, if I base this in things like relationships you're never too young to learn how to respect people and talk to them and, and learn about the power of kindness and empathy. So I think that I'm, I'm starting to understand why that's so important and however I do it, I'm not really sure how, um, I think I want to take that message to, to even a younger generation. We're going to take a break right here. When we come back, we're going to continue the conversation about the book, uh, about what we can learn about negotiation and much, much more. We'll be right back. What does it take to turn those big ideas and dreams into reality? Well, the answer might surprise you. Community. Having the right community around you makes all the difference when you chase your big ideas and dreams. When you face an obstacle, you have people around you to support you. When you have a question you can't answer, you have a community around to help you give those answers. When you have a big win, a big victory, you have a community around to cheer you on. But where do you find a community of dreamers, of idea makers, of innovators, of of inventors, of entrepreneurs? Here at JumbleThink, what we've done is we've launched the JumbleThink Facebook group to help you find the community, the tribe, to turn those dreams and ideas into reality. 
Well, how can you find the Jumble Think Facebook? Simply go to jumblethink.com slash group. It'll take you right to Facebook, right to the Jumble Think Facebook group, where you can join our tribe of dreamers and idea makers just like you. So stop trying to chase those dreams and ideas by yourself. Get into a community of people just like you who want to see you win, who want to support you, who want to cheer you on. So head on over, jumblethink.com slash group, and join the Jumblethink community. Now let's return to today's conversation. We are back with Maury Teherapur. All right, as we continue the conversation, there is something we need everyone to know because this book is so valuable. And that's how can they find and connect with you? How can they find and purchase the book? Uh, How can they get connected? So the book is on um, virtually all the sort of outlets online. So Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, you can pretty much find it anywhere. How can they be connected to me? So here's another upside of of where we are today is that I generally speak at at conferences or in in classrooms or have clients. Um, I'm finding that now that we're in this sort of virtual world, uh, if I want to bring this message to the world the way I feel like I could and I should, then I have to use sort of online um, and virtual resources to do that. So I'm thinking a lot about um, opportunities to do, um, you know, taping sort of Mm. whether it's podcasts or like we're doing today or I'm doing sort of short videos just because I can't let the fact that I can't leave this apartment be the reason why I can't spread this message. Mm. So it's making me be a little bit more um, you know, thinking about unique ways of doing this, being a little bit more creative about it. So um, it's like TBD to be determined. But yeah. I think that's that's where my focus is going to be is how do I get this message out despite the situation that we're in. As I went through the book, there were several themes that I personally resonated with, some that I went, oh, this is really good information. One of the ones that I resonated most with was this idea of the pleaser and how it impacts negotiation, mm-hmm. how it impacts our lives. Because Many times I am the pleaser. Uh, I am the person who wants to make people happy, whether it's with clients, whether it's with the quote or our proposal I send over. I want people to be happy with it. And and you say that there's a lot of hidden danger there. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, people pleasers, um, you know, their, their focus is really on things like relationships, right? Yeah. Um, making sure that the people around them are taken care of and their needs are taken care of and really giving of themselves in a way that ensures that. Um, there's really nothing wrong with that. A lot of people think these are more more sort of accommodating type individuals. So the fact that they have such generosity of spirit, it's not that that's bad. It's not that that's where the danger is. It's the fact that they don't turn that on themselves first. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, you know, this notion of empathy is really important, but oftentimes pleasers forget to turn that empathy on themselves Mm. um, and really sort of take care of themselves first. And somehow we've been taught that that's selfish or um, you're sort of too focused on your own needs and that's not what you should do. But the truth is that if you don't take care of yourself, nobody will. And it doesn't have to be that you take care of yourself and don't have room to take care of somebody else. It's just that when you are at your best, you're actually better at taking care of others. Um, it's sort of like the oxygen mask on an airplane kind of scenario, right? So um, it, the, the, the notion is self-care is important mm-hmm. um, and, and using this opportunity to bring your voice, find your voice, find yourself – um, is most important and everything else will fall into place because very rarely have I seen somebody who's a pleaser all of a sudden become so selfish that they can't focus on other people. It just doesn't happen. Um, so focus on yourself first. There's really nothing wrong with that. And in doing that, it seems like, you know, in business for me, especially in, in other small business owners and entrepreneurs I talk to, so often they're wanting to make sure they get the deal or they get the right, uh, you know, contracts, not even the right contracts. Usually it's like, like this whole scarcity thing, which, which we're going to talk a little bit more in a minute about Mm -hmm. where it's like, I just need to get the project. And, And in doing that, they're diluting themselves. 
this question of value and who defines your value, I think is important both to the pleaser and to people who are on the opposing side of that. When it comes to defining value, where do we need to define our value? Who needs to define our value? You need to define your own value uh, because if you don't believe in your own value, um, if you don't understand why you're worth uh, that conversation or that deal or whatever it is that you're you're asking for, then who will, right? The, there's nobody um, more worthy of that than you. And I think that, again, if you really start there um, and you embrace who you are and why um, you're so important to that particular conversation, then you won't ever be able to convince somebody else. And so defining your value comes in many forms. It could be, you know, when we talk about people pleasers, it could be just setting your own boundaries, mm. not saying yes to everything, right? Knowing that your time is valuable and out of 24 hours a day, if you did everything for other people, then where's the time for you? Um, so, so all of those things are really interconnected. Um, and again, determining and understanding and focusing on your value doesn't mean that you're diminishing somebody else's. Right. Right. It just means that you're bringing your best self to that conversation. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, this is an important, I want to go a little bit deeper on this because mm -hmm. so many people mentally know like, Hey, I need to value myself. I need to put value on my, what I bring to the table. That could be emotionally, that could be a product or service that could be intellectually. There are so many different values that we have to offer the world. And, and just like you said earlier in the show, you know, there's this, this concept of being an imposter in a space like, Hey, you know, yeah, I might be a good business person. I might be a good educator. I might be a good whatever, but you know, I, I don't really measure up. How do we get over that hurdle of seeing ourselves truly and being able to value ourselves for that? Because I think a lot of times we underestimate ourselves. I think a lot of times we undervalue ourselves because there's almost a shame or a guilt in mm -hmm. what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, <laughs> completely and totally. So – uh, one of the sort of large swath of students that I teach are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem that you see with a lot of small business owners, entrepreneurs, um, because, you know, there's for every entrepreneur, they have some stories of how they failed or something didn't work out or, mm -hmm. you know, they go through, you know, bad economic cycles like we're experiencing right now. And those things create scars, right? Those yeah. bad experiences sort of chip away um, at our value and the way we see ourselves. And somehow we internalize um, those situations and think it was my fault or I should have been better or I could have been better and I wasn't. And uh, the same way we internalize that sort of the negative, um, sort of the, the soundtrack, the place in our mind, we also don't internalize enough mm. our achievements and our accomplishments. Um, so you know, it's actually it seems like a really simple exercise, but if you sit every day, um, particularly before you have these sort of negotiations and these conversations, and you make a list, you make a list of your accomplishments, you make a list of things that you do really, really well, mm -hmm. um, and you you will be absolutely surprised. First of all, how many you can come up with, um, but the the second thing is that you'll realize that. These things didn't happen by luck or yeah. by accident. Yeah. You know, you worked hard. It's the blood, sweat, and tears that you put in. It's the work that you put in. It's the resilience that you had um, that created those opportunities. And so all that is is really storytelling, um, using, using a few minutes, again, in your preparation or when you wake up that morning and saying, no, this is why I deserve my seat at the table. This yeah. is why I need to ask for what's important because, it, because I deserve it. I've worked hard for this. You know, you're talking there about understanding our stories, our, our history, our, mm -hmm. our foundation of who we are. And there, you mentioned the scars, there are the scars. And on the flip side, there are those victories that set up our successes that build foundations there. 
I think that the the deeper story of stories is expectations of, of viewpoints and and how we view ourselves, how we view others. How how do we need to re adjust our expectations because they in, in, impact what we get. They impact right. how people view us. They impact how we view ourselves. So how do we need to really change those expectations so that we're looking to the fo- forward and not looking backwards to those failures or those those disappointments? Sure. Uh, so in negotiations, there's actually a tremendous amount of research that mm-hmm. shows that you know people who set really sort of aspirational goals um, going into negotiations, right, which define their expectations. So they're optimistic. They they look at goal setting as not something that you absolutely have to accomplish or otherwise you're a failure, but they think about goals as the thing that drives you Mm. um, and the things that make you aspire for more. Those people, as research shows, actually do better in a negotiations. So that to me is the most empowering and powerful thing that I can tell my students. Again, Mm -hmm. you are in the driver's seat. So if your expectations define what your outcome will be, then why not set better, bigger, more lofty and aspirational expectations? Because you will bring that into reality. The opposite of that is also true, right? You back off of the aspirations, you play it safe, you're afraid of asking for more. Research shows that those people will actually then accomplish exactly those things, which is um, diminished goals, right? Diminished outcomes. Um, And so isn't that powerful? I mean, what, what more can I tell my students that doesn't make them think? Yeah. Wow. It's, it's in my hands, right? The world is my oyster. Like this is what, this is where my voice matters. And I think that that's really incredible of all the things that I teach people. I think that's one of those things that if, if they really take it in, that's such a huge paradigm shift that it changes their thinking sort of instantaneously. Right. And, and that gets to the, the story, the, the the process of assuming abundance versus scarcity. And and we yes. hear a lot in our society about scarcity thinking, but but I don't think there's a lot of great information of about abundance thinking. Uh, you know, we talk about overcoming scarcity, but that has to be replaced by something. So you talk about assuming abundance. Talk to us a little bit about mm-hmm. the 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 paradigm shift of, of moving from scarcity to abundance and how that actually impacts especially right now i think a lot of people are afraid of coronavirus yes. it's going to hit our impact our in, impact our economy it's going to impact our social standards it's going to impact how we live and i think there's a lot of people in fear right now and they're going mm-hmm. to scarcity when they don't have to so talk to us about that that shift yeah so when i hear scarcity um what I hear is limitations. Mm. Um, and oftentimes it's situational, right? Like what, how our socioeconomic status at that moment is limiting us. Um, how, you know, there's, there's only room for one woman at the, at this, in this boardroom. So I won't let anybody else get this opportunity because that's going to limit my growth Mm. potential. What we're living through today absolutely exposes those fears, yeah. right? This is, we're in real unknown territory. I mean, people have the right to feel afraid because it's scary. It's, it's, and it's, it's not a man-made issue. This is not like the banking industry has, has, you know, gone topsy-turvy and we're all sort of victims to that. This is a pandemic. Um, and so I don't blame people for being afraid, but what fear does is it limits our thinking. It doesn't allow us to look for opportunity um, because all we want to do is just hold on to whatever we have, right? And so that is the that is the downside of being in a with having a scarce mindset. Yeah. How do you think about abundance then, right? It can't be that easy, um, but it, it's not. But it's sort of a very deliberate commitment to not putting limitations on yourself, thinking about an opportunity in just about every situation. And I think that as hard as it may appear, there is something so um, 
empowering, but motivating in that. And that's so when you walk into, let's say, a deal and it seems really difficult at the outset, you know, if we're talking about negotiations, yeah. instead of thinking, wow, this is really going to be difficult. I don't even know how we're going to come to, um, you know, a deal that's going to work for us. The opposite of that is, you know, this is difficult, but there's got to be a way, right? Yeah. There's got to be a way that we can actually navigate this conversation and get to someplace better. Both of those things may have the same facts that drive them, but one mindset says, I'm so afraid, let me just hold on to what I can get, which is very limiting. The other one says, yeah, it might be difficult, but there could be an opportunity in this. Yeah. Let's open our minds and and be creative and think about possibilities. So it's in your hands. Again, a lot of what I say in this book and a lot of what I feel is that we drive our destiny. We yeah. drive the way our everyday goes, right? And so um, because you're so powerful, you can change your mindset and you can change your opportunities. Um, one is plentiful and the other one is limiting. So much more we could talk about. And for those that are enjoying this conversation, I think it's a really valuable conversation. Make sure you check out the book, Bring Yourself, How to Harness the Power of Connection to Negotiate Fearlessly. We're going to take a break right here, and when we come back, we're going to do rapid-fire questions with Maury. We'll be right back. On the next episode of Jumble Think, our guest is Kelly Earnhardt Miller. She is the daughter of racing legend Dale Earnhardt and the sister to Dale Earnhardt Jr. She is the co-owner and general manager of Junior Motorsports, in the episode, we're going to talk about her new book, Drive, Nine Lessons to Win in Business and in Life. We're also going to talk about what it takes to grow up in racing royalty. And we're also going to talk about how NASCAR is changing in the world of coronavirus. Super fun conversation. So make sure to check out our next episode with Kelly Earnhardt Miller. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions with Maury Teherapour. Levez seulement le bras pour mettre l'aiguille sur le disque. Mettez le contact. We are back with Maury Teherapour. All right, are you ready for rapid fire questions? I think so. Hopefully, my coffee's kicking in. So, yes, let's go for it. <laughs> yeah, we're doing this interview at 8 a.m. on a Monday. I mean, those are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, maybe the GM of a of a sports team, I think, of uh, football. Actually, that's, that's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> what is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream, and they don't know where to start? They start with better understanding themselves, mm. um, and and understanding how they themselves can get to that big idea with respect to their their passion, their their. Um, skills, their 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 drive. Um, so looking inward and finding all the reasons why you're worthy of that big idea, that big goal, and how you can get there. I think you can chart your own path. What is one change you would like to see in the world? I think we're almost seeing it now. I think more humanity, mm. more empathy, more kindness, that people look at how we can find affiliation and connections before we think about how we're divided. Um, and it's actually magic. I feel like we're getting more of that today than we were even a month ago. It's, it's pretty incredible. What do you want your legacy to be? That I empowered people to find their best self. Hmm. Where do you find inspiration? In my students every day In my students just, uh, their excitement and their enthusiasm and their open minds and their commitment to themselves and their learning. Um, absolutely. my students, what is one book you think every dreamer should read? I think I'm still all about anything and everything that Dale Carnegie has, has written. Yeah. So going all the way back, but how to win friends and influence people. And largely because we can dream, but we are nothing um, without people yeah. who are around us, people who can help our connections, again, humanity. So I'm all about, you know, why, why our relationships matter most and how we can have a place in the world, um, alongside those individuals and how they boost us and help us. So treat people better, be kind, and you can get there. 
For you, how do you define success? Personal happiness and satisfaction. Um, feeling like not that every goal you've ever wanted was achieved, but that you feel like you're almost satiated, that mm-hmm. there's, there's satisfaction that you feel from it. What is one trend you are currently excited about? Um, I, you know, in a weird way, as much as it scares me, I'm sort of now really looking forward to this distance learning um, opportunity and, and communicating using the power of the internet, not in lieu of classrooms and that experience, but as a way to amplify um, what I have to say. So it's kind of cool to to learn about all these tools and, and using it to really bring my message out to people. What is one habit you find helpful in your life? Working out, taking care of myself physically, mm. um, because I think it it helps me then mentally and emotionally. Um, I'm better when I can use that 20, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, as part of my day to give myself that gift of um, fitness and, and well-being. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? That I had more control over my destiny. That's really good. <laughs> if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Hopefully actually working in sports full time, finding my way there so that, that uh, maybe I could get closer to being that GM. That's pretty awesome. And finally, <laughs> what is one dream you are still wanting to fulfill in your own life? You know, it's not so much a dream as it is just making, understanding how I can make more time for myself to do the things that excite me or that I'm interested in. I feel like, you know, with all the travel that I do, the days go by so fast that I would really look forward to a time where I can carve out more time to read, um, more time to sort of satiate my curiosity. And so, you know, I look forward to that. I look forward to to giving myself that gift at, at some point. As we wrap up, we always like to leave our guests to have a final thought. What is your final thought for all of us listening today? Be kind to yourself. Mm. Um, these are these are those moments where you really need to sort of dig deep and and be at your best. And it's okay to be fearful. It's okay to to not know what's going to happen tomorrow. But taking care of yourself and emotionally and physically, spiritually, um, is really important because the better you are, the better you can be tomorrow and the day after. So I think that's really, really important, and, and especially now more than ever. Maury, thank you so much for taking time out. Uh, I'm, I'm loving the book, still working my way through it, but getting there and I'm, I'm enjoying every moment of, of reading it. Thank you. I, I love to hear feedback. These are my first sort of uh, moments of getting that kind of feedback from people. So I appreciate it. Once again, we want to thank Maury Teherapour for taking time out to be on the show. You can check out her website at MauryTeherapour.com, and those links are in the episode notes. We here at Jumble Think have a simple belief that all of us are created for something awesome. It doesn't have to be to be the president of the United States or to be a global leader or the next best athlete. But all of our dreams matter. All of our ideas are significant. And that's my challenge to you today. You know, you have to value yourself before you can really make the impact you're created to make. So today, take some time to step back and look at your value. How are you viewing yourself? Where are the places that you're undervaluing yourself? Where are the places that you're inflating that ego? Maybe a little too much. Take some time today to work through those, to to process, to actually see the value you have. Thanks again for tuning in to Jumble Think. Now it's your turn to dream big and to change the world around you. Ôtez tout ce qui peut vous gêner ou tirer votre attention. Cherchez la meilleure position. Les bras et les jambes légèrement espacés. Étirez-vous doucement, mais complètement. En avant, en arrière, sur les côtés. Vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent 
peut également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois, lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.